you try to Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is Burlington City Council meeting number eight, April 16th, 2012 at 630 Thomas J. Smith Council Chambers. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Kathleen, roll call, please. Anderson? Aye. Uh, here. Davidson? Aye. Uh, here. <laughs> you got me started. Fleming? Here. McCampbell? Here. Ray? Here. Okay, here we go. We have a number of proclamations first tonight. I think there's seven of them on this sheet. And this first one is always an interesting one Teach Children to Save Day. And Councilman Campbell has that one. Uh, we have a proclamation, whereas the American Bankers Association Education Foundation established the National Teach Children to Save Day to spotlight the importance of teaching our nation's youth about saving money. Uh, they set aside April 24, 2012 for bankers across America to teach young people about how money works and how to use it wisely. And whereas, according to the U.S. Department of Commerce, our small low national savings rate rivals the rates during the Great Depression. And whereas the current economy, rising numbers of American personal bankruptcies, especially with young adults under 25 years of age, the increase in consumer credit debt, the lack of school performance, or personal finance classes, and the lack of adequate retirement savings emphasizes the, the importance of the introduction, uh, introducing children to the concept of saving money as a first step to their healthy financial future. Um, this is uh, now, therefore, we, the city uh, Council of the uh, City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby proclaim April 24, 2012, as teach children to save day. Uh, good savings habits start early and healthy money skills last a lifetime. Amen. Vicki Bradar and Charlie, and we usually they have the students from the banks come and tell us all about what they've been doing. So step up and jump right in. Hi, I'm Julia Messer, and I am a teller at Our Future Savings Bank at North Hill School. In March, we celebrated our 15th birthday. Our school bank was the first bank to open in Southeast Iowa. In 15 years, we were open 406 times, hired 297 student employees, opened 733 student accounts, made 14,742 deposits, 
deposited $90,625.07. Our school grown-up staff opened over four years ago and has 20 accounts who have saved $11,960.07 this year. Thank you. Any wow. questions? Thank you very much. Very good. 11000 plus yeah. this year. Can I borrow some money? No. No. <laughs> She's learning. She's got to figure it out already. Okay, who's next? <laughs> Hello, I'm Lucy Cockrell, the board secretary at Blackhawk Bank and Trust. This year, we have 143 customers. We have been open 24 times this year. The total amount deposited is $12,970.07. <coughs> the grand total saved is $43,535.04. Our school staff has 23 customers who have saved $10,703 this year. Do you have any questions? Wow. Good job. Good job. And next we have... Hi, I'm Kylie Wheeler, board president of Saving Up With Core School. This year we have had 114 student customers, been open 26 times. We have deposited $7,163.97. Grand total saved, $26,250.30. Our school grown-up staff has 19 student customers who have saved $11,166.34 this year. Do you have any questions? Oh, that's outstanding. Nice job. Thank you. I broke it. No. I think so. It'll, that's it'll, going to cost the city money. It'll be okay. Hello. I'm Sydney Schwanker, teller at Notre Dame's Kids Count Bank. This year we have 145 customers. Wow. We've been open 28 times. We've deposited $20,157.04. Grand total saved $59,912.94. Our school grown-up staff has eight customers who saved $6,959.70 this year. Do you have any questions? Do, do, can, do you know what, when they come in to say, what's the average deposit that would you? 110, 5, 12, <laughs> 6? $9.29. $9.29. Okay, thank Very you. Good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> you don't really need to adjust that microphone. It's sensitive enough it'll be able to hear you. Hello, I am Keegan Jones, Board Secretary at Great River Christian School Bank. This year we have 49 student customers, been open 21 times, deposited $5,124.43. Grand total saved $20,282.33. Our school grown-up staff has eight customers who saved $3,126 this year. Do you have any questions? No, thank you. Thank Way you. to go. Way to go. Thank you, kids. Good evening. I'm Vicki Bredar, Kids Bank Coordinator, and I'm going to give you the totals. We also have a uh, Kids Bank in West Burlington, and these totals represent that school also. Total, we have 157 employees, and these are just students that serve as board of directors and tellers every week. Uh, we have a total of 885 customers, student customers. This year uh, alone, they've saved $69,771.58. And that's with a $25 limit. The students are, no, are they're not eligible to bring in any more than $25 a week. And we've been open 172 days with all seven schools. And the total balance of all these accounts uh, currently is $236,579.66. Man, we can almost fix Cascade Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some questions for you kids. <laughs> um, and the grown-ups, we have 120 customers who have saved $62,620.40. And I do want to introduce Evan Youngquist. Poor uh, Evan, he's from Sunnyside School. He wasn't able to make it tonight. He's really sick. Oh. Um, and uh, I heard from his mother today. And at Sunnyside School, um, 
we have 186 customers and this year they uh, have saved $14,488. But we wanted to thank you for allowing us to come and, and uh, allow you to have a proclamation on our behalf. And do you have any questions from me or the just kids? To, just a comment, I guess that kind of should be a lesson to all of us that it doesn't take a lot at a time to eventually make some money saved. And, yeah. and, and I have a comment too because uh, I have a six-year-old grandson at Blackhawk right now and he was so excited that he can do this banking and he just is so excited about it and, and it's a great program. Okay. Um, here. Shane, you want to give them a... My son takes my change from work. <laughs> <laughs> they love, they just they love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, who am I presenting this to? They're arguing over how many give it to. I'm sweating. I'm not uh, Before I give this to you, I'd just like to say that uh, when I was growing up, we had thrifty cats. I don't know if anybody remembers. That was a long, long time ago. Uh, but I think that's awesome that you guys are getting that already in your heads that it's a good thing to say. And uh, hopefully... Um, some of you young gentlemen and uh, ladies will be taking some of our places to help Burlington continue to save money. Thank you very much for what you guys are doing. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank, you, thank, you. thank you, parents, and thank you, students, and thank you, Charlie and Vicki. All right, moving on. Becky has the next one. Yeah, I'd like to present a proclamation for Equal Pay Day. Um, whereas 40 years after the passage of the Equal Pay Act and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, women and children of color continue to suffer the consequences of inadequate pay differentials. According to statistics released in 2006, the average weekly wage for full-time working women was only 77% of the earnings of year-round full-time working men, indicating little change or progress in pay equity. And whereas if women receive the same salary as men who work the same number of hours, have the same education or union status, are the same ages and live in the same regions of the country, then these women's annual family income would rise by $4,000 and poverty rates would be cut in half. And whereas according to an analysis of data in over 300 classifications provided by the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics, Women earn less in every occupational classification for which enough data is available, including occupations dominated by women, such as cashiers, retail sales, registered nurses, and teachers. Higher education is not free from wage discrimination, according to the U.S. Department of Education analysis, reporting that after controlling for rank, age, credentials, field of study, and other factors, full-time female faculty members earn nearly 9% less than their male counterparts. And whereas over a working lifetime, this wage disparity costs the average American woman and her family an estimated $700,000 in lost wages, impacting Social Security benefits and pensions. Fair pay equity policies can be implemented simply and without undue cost or hardship in both the public and private sectors. Fair page pay strengthens the security of families today and eases future retirement costs while enhancing the American economy. Tuesday, April 17th, symbolizes the time in the next year in which the wages paid to the American women catch up to the wages paid to men from the previous year. Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 17th, 2012 as Equal Pay Day in the city of Burlington, Iowa, and urge the citizens of Burlington to recognize the full value of women's skills and significant contributions to the labor force and further encourages businesses to conduct an internal pay evaluation to ensure women are being paid fairly. And who? Melan is Melanie here? Come on. Okay. So Melanie, you want to come up and... Did you want to speak or anything? Mr. O'Brien, I just want to thank the City of Burlington for uh, providing this proclamation and on behalf of women everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Next is Mayor Pro Tem Reed. Okay, I have a proclamation here. Whereas, the, whereas Burlington City Council and the Keep Burlington Beautiful Committee wishes to protect, preserve the land, water, air, and other natural resources for future generations. And whereas 
whereas this Burlington City Council and Keep Burlington Beautiful Committee wishes to observe the 12th local Earth Day anniversary. And whereas the Keep Be Burlington Beautiful event supports and strengthens the goals of environmental sustainability and helps to keep the city of Burlington and Des Moines County clean and vibrant through cleanup activities. And now therefore, we, the City Council of City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby acknowledge Saturday, April 21st, 2012 as Earth Day 2012 in the City of Burlington, Iowa, and invite all city residents to attend activities and participate in the Keep Burlington Beautiful Citywide Cleanup on that day. Signed and sealed the 16th day of April, 2012. Um, the Mayor, Jim Davison. And that goes to uh, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to say a couple things on the event. Sure. Um, this is the 12th annual cleanup. Uh, it's held every year down at the Port of Burlington. Um, we sponsor the cleanup where individuals go out through the community and pick up trash and litter and then uh, bring it back and it's hauled away. Uh, but the event is uh, 8 o'clock on Saturday, April 21st. Uh, come down at 8 o'clock and register at the Port of Burlington. We'll give you a location, a bag, uh, gloves, and send you out to pick up and beautify the community and then can come back uh, around 11 and have a free lunch. Um, anyone that comes down also has, gets a free t-shirt. So. Uh, we invite everyone to come down, uh, invite any city council members to come down. Uh, it's a great community event and a great way to beautify the community. So thank there, you for your support. Is there an age on volunteers? There's not. Um, we have locations where we can send out little kids. A lot of Girl Scouts come, okay. age five, six, seven. So depending on the family, um, we can send you to a location that's safe uh, if you have family or young kids. And um, we send the uh, adults and those a little more eager out to some of the <laughs> little more difficult spots, but we have a spot for everyone. So this is an event we would like to not have every year if the community cleaned itself, but um, mm -hmm. we'll continue on with this as long as it needs to be. So we thank, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rick. Next, we have Youth Appreciation Week with Councilman Fleming. Whereas the vast majority of the youth are concerned, knowledgeable and responsible citizens, and whereas the accomplishments and achievements of these young citizens deserve recognition and praise of their elders, and whereas Optimus International has since 1954 developed and promoted a program entitled Youth Appreciation Week, and whereas the citizens of Burlington, Iowa have indicated a desire to join with the Optimus in expressing appreciation and approval of the contributions of the youth. And now therefore, we the City Council of the City of Burlington, Iowa, to hereby proclaim the week of April 30 through May 4, 2012 as Youth Appreciation Week. In Burlington, Iowa, by this action, let it be known that we have faith in the ability of today's youth as they assume responsible roles in the future of mankind. Signed and sealed the 16th day of April, Jim Davison, Mayor. Is anybody here to accept this? Ah, yes. Jamie. Want to say a few words? Yeah, I'm Jamie Blow, and on behalf of the Burlington West Burlington Optimist Club, we would like to thank the city for acknowledging Youth Appreciation Week once again. Um, it was quite an honor to actually be on the committee and to see all the outstanding youth. We reviewed over 60 applications and to um, actually have our event on May 2nd at Pizzazz Convention Center and to er, recognize the outstanding youth that we do have in the community. So I thank you. Thank you, and there are there are a lot of them, aren't there? Yes. All right, we have three more. We're back to Councilman <laughs> McCampbell for Arbor Day. Okay, uh, whereas in 1872, Jay Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. Whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate or moderate in temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen and provide habitat for wildlife. Trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fire, and countless other wood products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community, 
Trees are a source of joy and spiritual renewal. And whereas Burlington, Iowa has been recognized as a tree city of the USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation and desires to continue its tree planting ways, now therefore we the city of, uh, Council of the City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby proclaim April 27, 2012 as Arbor Day in the city of Burlington, Iowa and urge all citizens to support efforts to care for our trees and woodlands and to support our city's community <coughs> forestry program. We further urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the hearts and promote the well-being and present uh, present and future generations. I until the 16th day of April, 2012, uh, Jim Davidson, Mayor. And Casey Chadwick. Casey's the man. I'm the man. He's the man. <laughs> Thank you. He's planning and he's grinding. Keep up the good work. All right. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you guys for your support. Um, just so you know, in the next month, we'll be putting in an excess 200 trees on the parking. Um, Wonderful. Good. So we're doing our job there. Another reminder, EAB is still on its way, Emerald Dashboard. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I was going to ask Just uh, FYI, there's a good workshop this Friday here at Pizzazz uh, Conference Center. Um, I think I've forwarded on, I believe. Um, just if you want to check it out and see what's on its way, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. So, okay. thank you. Thank, thank you, you Casey. Thank you. And if any anybody out there wants to take advantage of the Burlington Tree Planting Program, we can, you can call Casey at uh, the Forestry Department, and they can get you set up for that. Councilwoman Anderson, clean out your files today. Yes. Another, okay, whereas every office worker generates about 10 pounds of waste paper monthly, and whereas one ton of recycled paper saves three cubic yards of landfill space, uh, 17 trees, 7,000 gallons of water, and 4,100 kilowatts of energy, enough to heat an average home for six months. <coughs> and whereas the 14th annual Clean Out Your Files Day being celebrated on April 19th is designed to increase recovery of office paper for recycling by encouraging office workers to purge old files of unwanted paper. And whereas this event is sponsored locally by the Des Moines County Regional Waste Commission, City Carton Recycling, Hope Haven Document Destruction, Titan Broadcasting, KCPS Radio, On Media Advertising, Burlington, West Burlington, and Mount Pleasant, Area Chambers of Commerce, and Downtown Partners, Inc. Now, therefore, we, the City of Bur the City Council of the City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby proclaim April 19th, 2012 as Clean Out Your Files Day in the City of Burlington and ask citizens, businesses, government agencies, and other organizations to strive to recycle whenever possible, not only on this day, but also throughout the year. Signed and sealed the 16th day of April, 2012, Jim Davidson, Mayor. Is there and someone to, yes, okay. Do you like to make a comment or two? Hi, not Hal Morton. Uh, Kevin <laughs> Giesling. Hal's a little bit taller, but uh, I want to thank you, uh, the City of Burlington, for the proclamation and uh, let you know that this is a 14th annual cleanup. Um, they did over 40,000 pounds last year. The goal is at least 50,000 pounds this year. Um, Part of what they do on Clean Out the Files is more than just that. They make aware of the services that we have available at the Recycling Center and in Mount Pleasant and other places. And um, recycling is the future. Yep. Um, the city of Burlington is uh, got to be a clean thing with the clean out and the city cleanups and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But you know, a lot of stuff is recyclable too. And uh, it's everybody's job, not just businesses. And it's right. individuals' jobs too. So right. wanted to thank you for the opportunity here. Okay. If you had any questions. Great. And that's Wednesday, right? Thursday. Thursday. Yep. Okay. You're putting Burlington. a lot of pressure on me, Hal. You're putting a lot of pressure on me. <laughs> Thursday. Yes, I know. Thank you. Thursday is the day. That's right. This is the 16th. Thank you. One more, National Day of Prayer. Whereas the National Day of Prayer is a tradition first proclaimed by the Continental Congress in 1775, and whereas in 1988, legislation setting aside the first Thursday of May in each year as a National Day of Prayer was adopted, and whereas Congress has declared Thursday, May 3rd, 2012 as the 61st consecutive observance of the National Day of Prayer, and whereas it's fitting and proper to give thanks to God by observing this day in Burlington, Iowa, when all may acknowledge our blessings and express gratitude for them. 
Now, therefore, we, the City Council of the City of Burlington, Iowa, do hereby proclaim May 3rd, 2012 as a day of prayer in Burlington, Iowa, and urge citizens of Burlington, Iowa to observe this day in ways appropriate to its importance and significance. Signed and sealed this 16th day of April, 2012, Jim Davidson, Mayor. And Pastor Sam Fratt is here to accept and do some explaining about what's going to take place. Thank you for this proclamation. We look forward to this day every year. It starts with a prayer breakfast, and it will be at 7 o'clock in the morning on May 3rd. That's going to be held at the Burlington Hotel downtown this year. And then at noon from 12 to 1, we're going to have an outdoor prayer and praise at the Port of Burlington. And then the evening service starts at 6.30, and that's going to be hosted at uh, Four Square on, on Curran Street. We will be praying for our community. We'll be praying for our leaders, our police department. Uh, we're praying for safety, for businesses. We're just going to cover our, our community in prayer. So we invite you to come and join us. Uh, Mayor is going to be reading the proclamation at that night as well. So thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Pastor. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Council. Council Willen, thank you. All right, we have next is a consent calendar. All matters listed under item one, consent agenda haven't been discussed or considered to be <coughs> routine by the city council will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is desired, then that item will be removed and will be considered separately. On the consent agenda to this week, we have finances and miscellaneous, minutes of previous meetings, payroll and city claims, Beer, liquor, wine, cigarette licenses, reports, and bonds. We are setting a date for a public hearing on May 7th, consideration of an ordinance rezoning property locally known as 514-516 South 6th Street from R4 to multifamily, uh, R4 multifamily to C2 general commercial. And that's it for the consent, except for one appointment in Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Mayor, we have uh, one appointment for the Construction Board of, Board of Appeals, Bruce Moppin. Thank you. Is there anyone from the audience who wish to have any of these items removed? Council, I entertain a motion then. Okay, I have a motion to approve all listed under item one consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you. All right, now we have a number of hearings to go through. First of all, this is the time set for a hearing for consideration of the annual consolidated transit funding application. Publication has been made in the Hawkeye as prescribed by law. Those for or against may be heard at this time. Uh, Dan, this is just a, a routine deal, right? Every year we go through this? Right. Uh, Doug from the Transportation Department's here to. Oh, okay. There's Doug. All right. Do you have any questions? Okay. Good evening, Doug. Good evening. Uh, yeah, this is our annual event to, uh, I guess, for me to come before the council and uh, talk about transit. Uh, this year's funding, we're looking at uh, $164,708 from STA and $253,034 from uh, FTA. Uh, i just like to point out that those two combined are about a $30,000 increase from last year. Okay. Uh, based on our ridership, it was up 18%. Um, and so far this year, we're even going even higher. So, oh, great. Um, so, what little, what uh, small pot, uh, segment of the population that uses transit, <coughs> they're using it a lot. So, mm -hmm. we look at uh, probably about 200,000 rides this year. So, wow. and uh, this past month, there was a couple days we had over 1,000 riders. Oh. So, mm -hmm. do you know of? Um, or potentially have a projection of maybe what the ridership increase would be if gas gets to where it says it's going to be at summer point? Um, yeah, I don't know if it'll... Usually all they do is offset 50%. Okay. So um, we're going to have to get a lot higher. And, and a lot of times they keep the funding down just so that we have to have local match plus the uh, passenger revenue. So... Um, we keep looking for opportunities to increase our ridership and our funding levels. So, yeah, that's my goal someday is so it breaks even and pays for itself. And, uh, 
might be a few years away. So, can you explain how how does it how does the bus system work? If people is it on demand? People can call in and get a ride. Is how that works? Oh, most of it is on demand. Uh, we do have fixed routes, and a lot of people call just to make sure they know where the bus is going to be. But we do start at five in the morning with uh, two shuttle buses that take people to work, um, and then we start our regular service at about uh, 10 to 7 in the morning and it runs until 5.30 at night. Mm -hmm. um, and then based on what's going on that day, whether it's a fixed route or depending on where people are going, we have uh, demand response or the fixed routes. Mm -hmm. most, most of them start at the depot and then go from there on the hour. So Okay. Yeah. And someone asked about the school transportation. Does the school contract with us for that or something? The school does not contract. Uh, what we do is we set up, the school kind of does boundaries for their uh, school buses, mm -hmm. and so we kind of pick up people within those boundaries that can't ride the school bus. Uh, okay, so they're yeah. responsible for their own fare then? Yeah. Right, yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah, There's we don't do any contracting. And, okay. Yep. Good. That's a question someone asked me, so I wanted to make sure. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Doug. Any yep. Council, any questions? Anyone from the audience have questions or comments here? Uh, Eric Renteria, 907 High Street. Uh, I'm not really advocating on behalf or against the idea of providing transportation in the city. Um, what I'd like to do is to reiterate what I frequently uh, bring to this council is that this is a program that we apply for state and federal dollars. We have to comply with state and federal guidelines, and it doesn't necessarily allow us to provide the optimal service for what we need. And we kind of write off a lot of this as, as we don't have to pay for it because there's a lot of federal dollars that come into it. And these are the types of programs that as a community, as a country, that we need to step away from. And if we're going to have local bus service, we need to fund that through the city of Burlington. And I understand that we can't unilaterally remove ourselves from this process, um, but we've got to we've got to be engaged with our state and federal officials and do away with these programs because they're it's basically a waste of money for us to pay money to the federal and state government only to have to beg that money um, back from them thank you, Rick. thank you anyone else wishing to speak on this issue seeing none council do we have any <coughs> comments All right, we have a motion uh, I'll make a motion to close second we have a motion to close the hearing. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Uh, I have a resolution approving the annual consolidated transit funding application. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion, Council? Okay, Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you. Another public hearing. This is the time set for a hearing for consideration of plans and specifications for the 2012 ongo ongoing seal coat reclamation project. Publication has been made in the Hawkeye as prescribed by law. Those for or against may be heard at this time. And we have some explanation from. Right. I have actually a new face for you, Ryan. Oh, Ryan is going to do it. Okay. Evening, Council. Hi, Ryan. Um, I'm here to talk about the ongoing seal coat reclamation that we're we've done for the past I believe it's three years this is year number four uh, this year we're looking at uh, reclaiming and reconstructing 4.2 um, miles of seal coat within the city um, the budget numbers for this year are $725,000 um, the 4.2 4.2 miles, our current estimate is right around uh, $735,700. So we're a little over, and it's been the process in the past that we will cut down the project to match our budget. Um, uh, as an additional part of this project, we've allocated some maintenance funds. Um, last year, we seal coated a portion of Sunnyside due to some substantial cracking that had occurred and the results of that have been successful. Um, so we're looking at potentially continuing that from um, Irish Ridge Road over to Cliff and potentially a couple other small areas in town. 
Okay. But beyond that, the project is 4.2 miles and will be within budget. Okay, thank you, Ron. Anyone from the audience wish to comment concerning this issue? Seeing none, Council, do you have questions or comments? I have a question. Um, talking about the sunny side um, portion <coughs> that we did last year and that we're probably going to pick up this year, you know, that street was put in five years ago. Um, why, what is causing that asphalt to crack and buckle as much as it is, or alligator as a... So. Um, I wasn't here at that time frame, so I can't attest uh, to the condition of the street prior to um, the resurfacing. There's a variety of things that could contribute to it. Um, I do know that a portion of Sunnyside was brick. I don't know if it was that portion or not. If it was, there's potential that some of that brick base could be shifting and causing that to reflect up through. Is there any alternative solution um, instead of doing a seal coat over top of that? You could, I just look at it as a very high traffic area and when it was done before in the past, just numerous complaints of a brand new street less than five years old having to have, you know, some people say, gravel for say all over the place yeah i was on the receiving end of several of those complaints <laughs> i just but know it's going to happen and yep. it's going to occur and again that's why I'm i expect it to happen again um there are other solutions to um potentially temporarily fix that um alligatoring issue but the cost difference between what the seal code is and what those um, other alternatives are tends to be more substantial and where we already have a project for seal coat we've already got a contractor that's doing the work which increases or decreases the cost even further so um, it's a consideration that's happened higher on the totem pole than me um, if you have any other concerns with it I'd direct you to the director of public works I would just rather spend the extra money and not have to go back and patch up in five years, though. <coughs> Personally. Anything else, Council? I do want to make a couple comments. I want to thank previous council councils for getting us started on the seal coat process. Um, is this, you say, the fourth year, the fifth year of the project? Five years ago, our streets were looking bad, getting worse, and so we've made a lot of progress. And <laughs> and uh, yes, we have more to go, but at least it's, it's just headed down. So I want to thank previous councils for that. Also, I want people to w be aware on, on those streets, you're going to have some dust. Uh, so <laughs> there's not anything we can do about it. You're just going to have to live with it for a couple months, and then it'll get better. All right. Okay. Anything else, council? Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you. Motion. Make a motion to close. Second. Kathleen. Anderson. Aye. Davidson. Aye. Fleming. Aye. McCampbell. Aye. Agreed. Aye. The resolution approving plans <coughs> and specifications for the 2012 ongoing seal coat reclamation project. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Kathleen. Anderson. Aye. Davidson. Aye. Fleming. Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you. Next, we, another public hearing. This is the time set for hearing consideration of the plans and specifications for the 2012 Blackhawk Elementary School sidewalk extension. Publication has been made in the Hawkeyes prescribed by law. Those for or against can be heard at this time. And who's going to take this one? That'd be Ryan again. Ryan gets to do this one too. Okay. Um, on the projector, I've got a map of the area. I'm sure you're familiar with the Blackhawk School area. Um, this project will uh, extend some sidewalks along the Navajo and Kessner and Sioux streets. It'll put, be installing new sidewalk along 14th Street to provide access for children walking to school in the area. Um, additionally, the 
area to the east of 14th Street, we will be regrading the ditch there to provide for better drainage along the street and sidewalk. Um, the budget for the project is $87,295. Our estimate is that it'll be just shy of $76,000. Uh, does the council have any questions? This is a grant from Safe Routes to Schools again, isn't it? Yes, this is a state Safe Routes to School project. Okay. Questions of Ryan, Council? Anyone from the audience wishing to make comment? Seeing none. Your Honor, I have a motion to close. Second. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. You know, a resolution approving plans and specs for the 2012 Blackhawk uh, Elementary Sidewalk uh, Extension. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion, Council? Okay, Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you. As you can hear, we turned the page, so we're on the second page now. We're headed down. All right, we have another public hearing. This is a time set for hearing consideration of an ordinance vacating various portions of streets and alleys in the Maple Lawn Edition, City of Burlington, Des Moines County, Iowa. Publication has been made in the Hawkeyes prescribed by law. Those for or against may be heard at this time. Who gets to do this one? Eric will have this. In the okay, Eric. The audience is like any of us. We had no idea what Maple Lawn <laughs> actually was, but you're about to find out. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Maple Lawn is actually a subdivision that uh, is contained por uh, partially within the limits of the uh, Southeast Iowa Regional Airport, um, and they're doing a title <coughs> opinion on the property, and uh, one thing they noticed was there's a few right-of-ways that had not been vacated, um, so this is kind of a cleanup of the area. Um, they are basically paper right-of-ways, uh, some of the alleys, and former street right-of-ways within the airport area. Um, they still exist on paper, and this is just a cleanup of that. Um, there are no actual streets within the right-of-ways. So uh, we are vacating the right-of-ways so that it uh, cleans up the title for the airport. Okay. Questions? Anyone from the audience with a question or comment? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion to close. Second. I have a motion to close the hearing and a second. Kathleen? <coughs> Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. You know, I have a motion for a preliminary adoption of the first reading of variant, or for an ordinance vacating various portions of the streets and alleys in Maple Lawn, Addition, City of Burlington, Des Moines County, Iowa. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. So, so moved and second. Any discussion? You're right, I didn't have any idea where Maple Lawn was either. <laughs> it's the streets that don't appear, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, Kathleen. Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you. Another public hearing. This is the time set for a hearing for consideration of a permanent <coughs> encroachment agreement between the City of Burlington and CCM Company LC for encroachment into Valley and Front Street right away. On the northeast side of the building at 107 Valley Street, Burlington, Iowa. Publication has been made in the Hawkeyes prescribed by law. Those four against may be heard at this time. Eric again. Eric's got this one again. Okay, Eric. Uh, yeah, oh, this is an encroachment um, at the southwest corner of Front and Valley Street. Uh, currently, it's uh, quite a step up to mm -hmm. the landing there. Um, there is no accessible way to get to the businesses on this block. Um, there's a step on the alley to the west and then a step on the north and east as well. So this will create a accessible route to those businesses from the street uh, street grade. And it, the image is shown there, uh, the ramp will go from east to west up um, from Front Street up to the sidewalk. Questions? <coughs> So this is on the on Front Street side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Any questions or comments from the audience? Mm -hmm. Come to the microphone. Okay. 
Mary Baker, 320 South 6th Street, Burlington, Iowa. I didn't quite understand where that is. Is it Valley, which is, is it between what, 3rd and 4th? No, no, this is on Front Street. It's down be, on Front Street? It's down across from Memorial Auditorium, yeah. where Frank Miller Company. Where the yeah. paint company, or is it a plumbing company? No, there? it's Frank Millard's, Frank. And, and there's a financial advisor down that corner now, too. Right okay. toward the end building before you get to the, tr the tracks. Right. And and I have a complaint. Why aren't these pictures darker and clearer? That's that's an ongoing project that we need because because this is a new screen, so we need to do something about these lights up here. So that that's something that we're going to be working on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else from the audience? Council, do you have any comments or questions? No. I, I guess I just want to comment that that is uh, quite an improvement, and I think it'd be a big help to people yeah, that are right. handicapped and even just regular people. I agree. Like short people, you know. <laughs> like it's, <me>. <laughs> it's good foot to step up onto. It. Yeah. I agree. So, I, mean, I agree with you. Okay. Entertain a motion. Okay. Make a motion to close. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Kathleen. Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. We have a resolution authorizing permanent encroachment agreement between the City of Burlington and CMM Company LC for encroachment into Valley and Front Street right of way of the northeast side of the building at 107 Valley Street, Burlington, Iowa. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments, Council? Seeing none, Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. <coughs> Thank you. Another public hearing. This is a time set for public hearing for consideration of a community development block grant downtown revitalization fund project application for downtown facade improvements within the 300 to 600 block of Jefferson Street. Publication has been made in the Hawk as prescribed by law. Those four against may be heard at this time. Who gets this one, Dan? I believe Eric will be talking about this, and basically you'll be authorizing the filing of an application okay. for this grant. Yep. All right, the, Eric. The city's partnering with Downtown Partners to secure a grant of um, 500000 to improve facades within the 300 to 600 block of Jefferson Street. Uh, this is through the Iowa Economic uh, Development Authority uh, through the state, and the plan would re rehabilitate facades for 18 buildings within those four blocks, um, and then the building owners would uh, contribute a match towards the project as well, and the city would hold an easement over the facades, um, which would be um, improving, decaying, outdated, inefficient storefronts and facades and windows within the area. Um, the city uh, would also have to provide a match, and I'd been uh, looked at to make improvements to the Steamboat Center uh, to bring that facade up to date as well. So. Okay. Any questions from Eric? Anyone from the audience wishing to comment? Stan, you want to go first or Eric? Eric Beecha. Okay. Uh, Eric Renteria, 907 High Street. Um, when this project was originally brought to the council, the impression that I received from it was that it was looking to take any involvement on the city. And that's kind of seems to have evolved a little bit where there is some type of match. And I, I just don't understand, I've never really gotten a feel for what it is exactly that the city is doing as a part for its match. I was wondering if I could just get some clarification on that. Eric, can you answer that question for me? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess the contribution from the city would be an update to the facade on the Senior Center at 501 Jefferson as part of the project, similar to some of the improvements to other facades within the area. Okay. Uh, there was the option to contribute a cash match as well, but uh, looked at this investment as something investing in a city property. So. Okay, thank you. So the city's not matching on any property owner's property, but only the property owner. Yeah, is yep, doing correct. The match. Property owner matches. We're taking care of our property. Stan, did you have a comment? Stan Stratton, 2809 Shamrock Drive. Yeah. The facade, what's it going to look like? What are we doing to the buildings? That's yet to be determined. 
Wouldn't we want to know what we're spending our money on? Well, uh, actually, well, I, I know something about this. Uh, there is a Main Street consultant coming in this Thursday, and um, he will be drawing up plans <coughs> to show what those will look like. Um, they'll look more like the nature of the building was originally, and depending on how much the owner wants to spend. You know, if the owner doesn't want to spend a lot of money, they can just be repainting their building. But um, those will be presented with the grant when they actually go after the money, would be the drawings of what those buildings. Yeah, it wasn't too many years ago what the old Carson Perry Scott building down there had all that aluminum in the front. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought that looked so bad and took it down. I thought we wanted to retain the original concept of downtown, so I'd assume we'd be painting it. Um, painting, painting. Painting the buildings? Well, um, actually, this has to go through the state historic, I mean, it has to go through SHPO, the state historic preservation officer, so it will have to retain their historic integrity to do this. That's the idea of this type of facade grant. Um, some buildings may be painted. It may be just the trim that's painted. I don't think brick will be painted unless brick is already painted. Then, it w then you're right. It would be painted. And so it probably will have a lot to do with painting buildings, probably more than anything. Uh, will that go up as far as the old panning building down there that's been abandoned? You might as well say abandoned. Um, I don't think it goes for any buildings that the owner did not um, agree to match. So really, you're going to be spending a lot of money making all the buildings look pretty, and you got that one down there that's going to tear down the whole project. Actually, we're not going to be spending mm -hmm. a lot of money. The, the city yeah. doesn't spend. The owner will spend 30%, and the grant will be 70%. Well, I think when Steve first time presented this at the work session, it was going to cost him like $60,000. It was 10 or 15% of the project, as I remember. And then the last time you guys talked, you thought, well, we could spend this money if we didn't want to fix the facade because that was a two-story building. You didn't know what you were going to run into. You thought maybe a redoing some streets or alleys or something? That was, one of, the, that was yeah, one of the options. Uh -huh. That was one option, yeah. So now we're back to fixing the Steamboat Center? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stan. Any other comments from the audience? Oh, I didn't see you there, Steve, or I wouldn't have said all that. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Steve, I didn't see you. It's Steve Freeford, Executive there. Director for Downtown Partners. Uh, it's been a long process, and we're only seeing the very beginning of it. Uh, I don't expect any of this construction really to start before the end of this calendar year. Uh, but uh, thank you for working with us, and we'll be working closely with the planning department to uh, get this grant in next week. We look forward to seeing the results. And, and, and I'm right now, Eric and Steve, we're, right now we're only applying for this grant. It's not a done deal, is that correct? Um, my understanding, and I was with some of the IEDA people last week, the funds are actually reserved for this project. Oh. We are not, I mean, that's the great part. We're not competing with our communities about this. Uh, the funds are already there. We just have to submit the final formal oh, application. Well, that's news. Oh, that's news. Okay. And, Thank you. And Steve, was I right in what I said in in the facade? I mean, was there anything you can add uh, to yeah, the Yeah, certainly. Stand? It's never a good idea to paint unpainted masonry. That's just <laughs> creating a, a maintenance issue where none existed before. And uh, most of this, uh, these projects will take place in the West Jefferson National right. Register Historic District. So, because it's using federal money, it will go through the State Historic Preservation Office for there. Uh, okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to close. Second. We have a motion and second to close the public hearing. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Uh, resolution authorizing a permanent encroachment agreement between the City of Burlington and CMM. Uh, company LC for encroachment of the valley in front of the That's Wait a minute, Shane. That's I'm reading one. the wrong one. <laughs> Six. I'm reading the wrong one. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I don't want to hear about from Bob about this later. A resolution authorizing the filing of an application uh, for consideration of a community development block grant downtown revitalization fund project for downtown facade improvements within a 300 to 600 block of Jefferson Street. Second that. <laughs> the second that. <laughs> Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, <laughs> Kathleen. Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. 
Motion is carried. Thank you, folks. <laughs> We're going to have a good time, can't we? <laughs> sure, why not? That shades his pants. Thanks for laughing at me because obviously you were laughing at me. <laughs> okay, we're looking at an ordinance now, and Council McCampbell, I believe you have this. Yes, uh, motion for a final adoption of an ordinance rezoning the properties locally known as 2270 and 2280 Florence Avenue to include a planned unit development, uh, the master's PUD overlay zone as allowed by section 17.20.40 of title 117 of the Burlington Municipal of the Burlington Municipal Code. All right, thank you. And we have a second? Second. We do have a second. Uh, this is our third reading of this particular ordinance. Uh, do we have anything new to add to this, Dan or Eric? No. 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 We'll open for public discussion. If you have something new to add to the discussion, we'd be glad to hear it. Seeing none. Yes, we do. I just want to point out one thing. I don't know if the I need your, but, I need your, okay. Uh, 27, 20 Lockmore. Uh, I'd sent a letter back October 13th to the other, to the previous uh, council regarding uh, water flow. Uh, and if, uh, basically the, the letter goes as follows. My name is John Reinschmidt. Kathy and I are the owners of Florence Outlot A directly south of the propo proposed development owned by Mr. Steve Zager. Mr. Zager's plans uh, show changing the natural flow of water, directing it onto our property. We have not given Mr. Zager or the city of Burlington an easement to dump the water on our property. This water from Mr. Zager's property is currently running off naturally elsewhere and we will not allow it on our property. It is our intention to develop in the future. Sincerely, John and Kathy Reinschman. Uh, I, don't, I wasn't able to come to the last two meetings, so I'm not sure what the, the water drainage situation is. Uh, if it is still planning on going to that particular uh, storm sewer, uh, I checked today uh, with uh, the streets department and there isn't uh, easement on record for that and I'm uh, planning on trying to have it moved to where the easement actually is. It looks like it was put in the wrong spot oh, when it was I originally see. put in. So if you'd like a copy of the letter, I don't know if any of you actually... No, yeah. We do have it. I remember. Uh, yeah. I would like it. Sure. I would take one too. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else? I remember. I have one. Do you remember one? Well. Yeah, I do too, John. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. John. Eric, can you answer or address that at all? I guess I may have to defer to Steve uh, there, but uh, I guess the rezoning is addressing the land use primarily through the subdivision. I guess the sewer and that plan would have to be in place um and that might be something right. it, ha it has to be done before he can yeah. get, get approval on his properties yes anyone else and i'm barbara hahn of 3216 crystal drive and i hope that you all received a letter that um i'd sent to you uh, summarizing some of my concerns about this uh, since the many things have been brought up before I did want to correct some statements though about the density would be the same as in with any R1 and I think that um, the exhibit that I sent with my letter shows uh, that it would be a more dense population, more concrete than it, if we're only an R1 development. Uh, I think that there have been several questions that we as neighbors have raised to you and they have not been addressed. As John just spoke about uh, the easement and the water, I have great questions about why the building would be allowed in this PUD only seven feet from the side of the lot. That doesn't seem to be allow for much water drainage there. And it's also very inconsistent with what was done with the houses of along Florence, the border crystal drive. Again, I, I think 
that I have some major concerns that some of the language used to set up this PUD have been taken out of context in the city code and I cited uh, two areas. At the very least, should you approve this, as in my letter, I asked for the courtesy of addressing certain items by the city before you vote, that written assurances be given to neighbors, and I have concerns again about the water, standing water, <coughs> and thank you. I hope you will think about this before you vote. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing none, council, do you have questions or comments? I have no comment at this time. Well, I, I guess I've been concerned about the water too, and I've brought that up, and um, I, I, you know, I feel like it's been addressed, and um, and that uh, those questions were answered. Um, I guess I don't know what else to ask about that water flow that um, couldn't be answered by the plans that Mr. Zager put forth. Councilman Campbell or Reed, do you have any, anything? No, um, I think I... Okay. Um, I intend to support this issue. I'm, I'm, I've said before I believe in personal property rights and, and this has been <clears throat> Mr. Zager's project meets the guidelines as set by our code, and so I really feel that we are obligated to uh, approve it based on that. All right. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Motion is carried. Next, we have a number of resolutions on our agenda, and uh, Councilman Fleming looks like you have all of them. Why is that? Uh, Kathleen likes you, I think. <laughs> okay, let's see which one do I first here. I have a resolution approving plans and specs for the Animal Control Center remodel and expansion. Do you want a second? I will second that. All right. Mr. Lutenaker, what do we have to say? Who's talking about that one for us? Um, what we have is we found out uh, through the process of doing this that the city had already approved had the resolution to approve up to five hundred thousand right. dollars for the building of this being as a city project on city land that has to go through the city's um, <coughs> bidding process uh, for that the plans and specs have already been before us so i was under the assumption that eric is going to be here but is somebody going to he's supposed to okay you're looking for him too um <laughs> and he was basically just going to go over what those plans were this was back in i believe a november meeting that this was all brought up and approved but now it has to have a formal approval of the plans and specs which have not changed since the original meeting okay and that's where we're at all right good who's yeah. going oh, there, there he is <laughs> just right on cue <laughs> you don't want to waste any time <laughs> right on cue buddy. boy just got off Man, the golf good. course <laughs> how's everybody doing tonight we are great oh, not as good as you have a day, but <laughs> a little windy <laughs> does anybody need a copy of the new plan or the plan I, I would like to you, copy. You might have. Can we throw it up on you your might have Eric throw it up. Oh, you throw it up on the over here. Oh, that's all right. Well, that's okay. Look. If somebody could turn out that middle light switch, that would help us. Nope. Yep. Somebody got some, Mary. There you go. You're on. Well, I guess, I mean, we've obviously had a public hearing on this, so this is the vote for the resolution to approve the plans and specs that have been submitted and uh, kind of been heard. Uh, we had a presentation and questions, so I guess at this point, uh, I want to hear from you guys if you have any further questions or any <coughs> lingering concerns about the plan or the specs. What was the uh, total square footage again? Just to uh, the current structure is 2,360 square feet. And the anticipated structure is 5510. Okay. When I look at that, though, 
I want to say that might include the 800 square feet that we knocked off okay. to reduce the cost, cost. The, the anticipated cost of the project. So I, I really think it's less than that. But And what would be the difference in the number of uh, dogs, cats, animals that we could house in this new facility versus the one we have now? I think we're adding additional 10 runs. Okay. And that is just in the kind of the normal runs. What we really are lacking, though, would be the uh, sick area or quarantined animals. I mean, that's a facility uh, or an ability we don't have right now. Uh, we're very limited in our room to be able to house those animals, and we don't have the separation uh, not only in kennel space or space period, but also in the HVAC ability so that you can keep the germs and, and any other health concerns separated, yeah. which is not only key for the animals, but also for humans. Right. That's you know one of the big things, and uh, being out there and touring the facility a couple of times, and, and looking at these plants, it is the clean air, the quality of air, mm -hmm. not only for the animals but also for the individuals that volunteer their times out there. Because you go out there, and unfortunately, people are almost stacked, and the animals are almost stacked on top of each other. So a little better quality of workplace as well as life for those things. It's going to make everything more efficient, not just for our staff, but also for the city staff, uh, the animal control officer, and the police department that utilize our facility, not just not just us. So, absolutely. I'm curious, I'm curious about the actual square footage. I'm just, <coughs> you know, I'm just wondering, do we, you know, why would we need to almost double the space? Well, it, it really goes back to, this was built in 78 originally. Um, since then, we've seen a huge increase in the number of animals that we service throughout the year, um, and not also, not only that, but also the services that we offer and the services that we need to in order to develop our system. And that includes procedures, uh, cleaning, quarantine of, an of sick animals, so that, well, not only sick animals, but when new animals come in, you just can't throw them into, for lack of a better term, general population without watching them for a while. Because if one of those, say, a dog has parvo and it spreads, and I'm not a veterinarian, but it spreads, you could end up wiping out quite a few of the animals. And so it's really not just, I don't look at it as necessarily square footage, it's really the uh, services that we're able to offer because we're not efficient right now. We're a very antiquated facility with what we have. And that I would agree with, that I would agree with. I just, I get a lot of people that are still wondering, um, they think that, uh, that you guys are building a Taj Mahal Don't for the say animals. that word. <laughs> that's good problem. That's good problem more times. But, uh, you know, and I just, I just want to make it perfectly clear. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not one to say let's build more prisons. I'm one for rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, when it comes to the animals, um, my approach would be to let's get stiffer penalties on the people that are, that are not being responsible where we wouldn't have to to invest so much, but um, I, if you don't mind, I would love to find out what the actual square footage was of that extra space. Was. I would go with the 5510 right now, and then I can check on that and verify. If it would be less, it'd be 800 square feet less. I know that. Um, and my question, because I know you started talking about this before I came on the council, um, is this completely run by volunteers? Do, is, are there any employees of the city? Do, does the city pay for employees, or is it is the, it completely run by the humane? Or the only employee that is out there that is actually employed by the city would be your animal control officer, and he is. I think that's really where he goes, but you know, it's kind of his home base. But he doesn't really work there every day, day in doubt. He's not the one that's doing the cleaning, doing the feeding, uh, servicing the public with whatever needs they have, answering questions putting animals on the site, anything like that, those are our 100% our employees. Mm -hmm. And do we get reimbursed from the city for certain services we render for animals that are there uh, to serve the city code? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. So, I mean, there's a reimbursement there. But the way that we really look at ourselves is we're a cost-saving measure for the city. And I think the previous mm -hmm. uh, city manager actually ran those figures, and I don't have them with me tonight. Uh, but I wanted to say it was 45000 minimum that yes. we so it, it's the been cost. that way like since 78 it's always been volunteers that have run that it's been a partnership uh, with the city uh, and the Humane Society since 1978 and there was a contract that I think ran for a 30-year period uh, which expired in 2008 and then it continues on and I don't have it in front of me but I believe it's three successive five-year terms uh, if we have the option to renew mm -hmm. right now I guess we are uh, 
in agreement on that, but uh, I think we want to rework a contract and move forward too. Well, I guess I want to say, because I see this in Burlington, I feel that we have outstanding volunteers in Burlington mm -hmm. and people who step up and, I, I mean, maybe you feel it's, I guess I'm thinking if, if we're paying up to 500000 I'm looking at what they're doing in time and what they're, they've gone out and raised. I think it's, I think, thank you, Eric, and, and everybody's been involved in that to do that. It's not really me. I, it's, there's too many nameless people that really have a lot more to do with it than I <laughs> well, do. Well, thank you and, and the, for the people you represent. Then. And we appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I should echo, too, is you know, our employees do a fantastic job out there. Um, I can't say enough about that. But the other thing is we wouldn't be the way we are if we didn't have the volunteers that you speak of. We have young people. We have youth organizations. We have uh, you know, grown people that come out there, walk the dogs, uh, volunteer all their services, and they also donate. Mm -hmm. Uh, much needed items that help facilitate our facility. Great. Others? Do you have an answer for my question? You're looking for a number? Yeah. It's 518,000 and change. 518. Okay. For those of you that don't know, I, <laughs> I wanted to know what the fundraising had, had come to, so um, that was that answer that question. Thank you, Eric. Sure. When, when is the bidding process starting? Has it already started? It hasn't started yet. Uh, the plan moving forward is uh, following a, a vote in the affirmative tonight. Uh, we would, on this Friday, April 20th, uh, take this out to bid. Um, so at that point, contractors, anyone can pick up the plans and start working on a bid that they could submit. Um, on April 30th at 11 a.m., we would have a walkthrough of the facility for contractors interested in submitting a bid so that they could see the site and what uh, essentially they'd be working with. Uh, and then on May 4th at 2 p.m., the bids would be due. Uh, and the bids can be submitted to the city clerk's office here. And then shortly following the bid deadline, we will be meeting uh, in this, these very chambers to open those bids. Are we working with local contractors on this, or are you going further than Burlington? We don't control who the contractor is. I mean, it, it, the bid is public, so the bid can be an out-of-state bid potentially, or out-of-state contractor bidding on it, who could be awarded it. The low bid will obviously receive the priority. Um, we won't know until the bids are open as to who that contractor is. If, if I had a way to get at it and have a local contractor do it, I'd be more than happy to do that. That would just be in violation of the competitive bid mm -hmm. procedure. So. Okay. Any other questions, Eric? Eric? No. Thank you, Eric. Uh, anyone Thank from you. the audience have a question or comment? Okay. Thank you to the rest of your you. Humane Society folks. Okay. We have a motion, a second, to approve plans and specs for Animal Control Center remodel. Uh, any other discussion? No. Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Three. Aye. Thank you. Full speed ahead. <clears throat> Resolution relating to the election for the imposition of a local option sales tax in the amount of 1% for the City of Burlington, Iowa to be effective January 1, 2013 through December 31, 2022 <clears throat> and specify purpose to which the revenue should be applied. Second. We have a motion to second. This is referring to the local option sales tax <coughs> referendum, which is coming up on August 7th. Any comments from the audience? I'm sorry, Chief, I didn't. Hey, <laughs> 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 he's counting down his days. <laughs> 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 You're right, you caught me on that one. Caught me on that one. <laughs> this is basically the, the wording that the uh, county. Uh, need for the to put on the ballot that's what you're approving here yeah. yeah and there is a sunset clause I want folks to notice it is going to sunset on December 31st of 2022 all right any questions or comments council uh, okay. I don't have any Kathleen Anderson Please. aye Davidson aye Fleming aye McCampbell aye Reed aye Thank you very much. Your Honor, I have a resolution awarding contract for the 2012 HMA resurfacing project. Okay. And we have a second, somebody? Second. 
Is this Mr. Hartman or are we? I, I think it is Steve this time. Yeah. Look at that. <coughs> Eric, would you mind turning that light back on for me, please? Thank you. Uh, this item was brought forward from the consent agenda uh, 2012 HMA resurfacing. Uh, plans were let. We received uh, three bids, with the low bidder being Shipley Contracting Corporation, the amount of $784,540.19. Uh, basically, the memo in front of you, uh, we recommend award to Shipley Contracting for... Uh, we, we do have an adjustment there. You've seen the... Uh, Mm -hmm. approximately $20 mathematical <laughs> correction but okay. other than that bids were in order uh, a recommendation is award to Shipley contract okay and this <coughs> this is um, significantly under the engineers yeah. engineers estimate then isn't it yeah. yes it is uh, asphalt prices uh, the, the asphalt bid item itself came in considerably lower should, should be a, a good year for the project. We, we can uh, look at in the future, once the project gets started, we could uh, entertain uh, change orders to, um, to expand the project at the unit prices. Mm -hmm. So we could bring that forward as a change order oh, if you'd like okay. to see that. That's yeah. an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is, there, is there any specific reason why that bid was so much lower? Uh, we've, we've got... Uh, some extra bidders this year it looks like we've got some new uh, producers in the market that we had for a long time one producer of asphalt uh, uh, it was Cessford construction or OMG Midwest uh, and we actually have a producer uh, Shipley contracting has a, an asphalt production arm now so I I suppose that that had some play in the in the price of the bid yeah mm -hmm. good wonderful any other questions from Steve no, just thank you for coming. I asked to put this on regular agenda. Just because with a large sum of uh, money out there, I always think it uh, gives a chance for the public to speak on it and, and ask questions. Thank you. Speaking of that, anyone in the audience wishing to speak to this matter? Seeing none. Council, do you have any other questions or comments? No. Thank you, Steve. I might wait here. Yeah, I'm I'm just, just, stay <laughs> just stay there. <laughs> Kathleen? Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Motion's carried. Next. I have a resolution awarding contract for the 2012 Cascade Watershed Sewer Separation Project Phase 1. Okay. And Steve is going to speak to this again. In a second. Oh, second. I'm sorry, Kathleen. Thank you for keeping me straight. Okay. Uh, again, uh, this project brought forward from the consent agenda. Uh, project provides for uh, storm sewage construction uh, in the process of separating our city sewers. Uh, four bids were received. Uh, low bid was Phi Excavating Incorporated uh, in the amount of $1,224,221.88. Uh, all paperwork and bonding is in order. Uh, as per the memo, we recommend award to Phi Excavating. This also is significantly under estimate too, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, our estimate was at uh, I believe 1.63 million, uh, and and that was that was maybe a a rough estimate. I think the contracting market's in good order right now. Yeah, that right. Uh, we had some good competition, so um, yes, yes, favorable bids. Yes, excellent. Uh, Council, you have any questions for Steve? Nope. No. Okay. Not this time. Thank you, Steve. At this time, thank you. All right. Any comments from the audience? Yes. Hello, my name is Mark Williams. I'm with the Indiana, Illinois, Iowa Foundation for Fair Contracting. This uh, project was bid on the 5th and uh, went to FI. And uh, I, last week I brought packets for all of you. Hopefully you received those and had a chance to go through them. I want to go over some stuff that was in those packets, just highlight a little bit. Actually, we don't really need to have that done. We've read them. Oh, you so, have? Okay. Yes, yeah. thank you. All right. Um, then what I want to say is that uh, uh, FI has numerous violations in DNR, with DNR, Department of Natural Resources. 
and also OSHA violations, the last one being in 11-27 um, of last year. Um, they also have uh, U.S. Department of Labor. They've had uh, complaints filed there. Um, I request that uh, possibly think about going with the next lowest responsible bidder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Stan? Stan Stratton, 2809 Shamrock Drive. Uh, the million dollars sounds terrific. I thought it was in the paper like it was going to cost us $30 million to redo that. Is that a total project or did I read that wrong? Well, yeah, this is only phase one yeah, of that project. One. Yeah. The entire we've, we've done other phases right. sewer. This is phase one in this area out there. Right, that's correct. Right. How much miles, yards? <laughs> That'd be for the man behind you. Ask Steve that question. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Stan, uh, we're looking at the need to separate sewers uh, all the way from the south end of town, which is the Cascade area. <laughs> the, the entire project. Uh, is from the south end of town, north toward about Division Street. Uh, north of Division was completed under the Hawkeye sewer separation. And a 30 million uh, estimate was for the entire city. It would include some, some tank storage areas. Uh, and we're looking at another, uh, I believe it's 13 years of, of progressive work on this. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Right. <laughs> tank storage, didn't we do this out there in the other end of town? Two tanks, what, million dollar, million gallon tanks or something? How's it working out? They're working well. Uh, we had the rain event over the weekend, and uh, I did receive email. I think I think we barely utilized the tanks during that rain event. They're made for a little bit bigger event. Uh, typically, we contain the, the wet weather events when there's extreme events, like in 2010. Uh, then we have overflows and we report to the DNR. So that is, that was to help our waste, waste treatment plan? Yes, sir. Yeah, all, all in conjunction with that. Okay. Thank you, Stan. Steve. Thanks, Stan. Any other quick comments? Ryan Drew, business rep with the operating engineers here in Burlington, Iowa. Uh, also a resident of Burlington, Iowa. Um, wanted to expand a little bit on uh, the, the packet. We work with the Foundation for Fair Contracting fairly closely. And uh, a lot of times we have contractors say, you know, we, to, to compete on these projects, we need everybody to play by the same rules, you know, a level playing field. Well, you know, a lot of corporations, they have the discretion of who they're going to accept bid on their projects. And just as he said a minute ago on the, the animal shelter, well, we can't screen out people. Well, the people before you have done a great thing by putting the uh, responsible better language in the Iowa code and you have that right and, and me personally as a resident of this community think you have that obligation to pick the lowest responsible better. Um, you know if this was a road project we wouldn't be here in front of you but uh, considering it's a sewer project uh, you've got men working down in and underground uh, putting this pipe in the ground it's very dangerous work. OSHA will tell you that uh, in the last five years we've had two injuries uh, in this area because of this work and contractors not adhering to the safety procedures that it's called for. Um, contractor right up in Weaver, Iowa, putting a new sewer in. Instead of calling 911 when his worker was buried, chose to dig him out to try and save his own rear from getting a violation. They still caught up with him and he got viol a violation for that. But what we're asking you guys as members of city council is to set that bar a little bit higher. I mean, obviously you've seen the bids. They're all well under the engineer's estimate. Uh, I contend to you in a market like it is right now and as competitive as things are, one has to wonder why somebody can cut 16% off their bid. Uh, is that the cost of doing the project safely? I'm not a construction engineer or estimator, um, but I can tell you the other two contractors that were within probably less than a percent uh, don't have OSHA violations. So I hope you will uh, seriously consider this. Um, it does send a message to the contracting community that you guys won't accept just the cheapest, the shoddiest work. Uh, and I ask you to raise that bar a little higher. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. Anyone else wishing to comment? Seeing none, council, do you have any comments? I have none. Um, I, I do. Uh, I would just, on the responsible part, um, I don't know, I, I know a lot of responsible people that have made mistakes. Um, Oh, I thought you were going to hit back up. I know a lot of responsible people that have made mistakes. 
Uh, can you, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Because well, I don't, you know, I, I worked with the previous monitor uh, before Mark started with the foundation. And I think that's a lot of what that packet's supposed to show you. It's one thing for a contractor to be learning the rules, get reprimanded by the DNR, get, get a violation by OSHA. The important thing is that they take that seriously and learn from it. As you can see by the repeat violations, they've chose to continue to ignore the proper way to do things. And that's the thing you guys should be troubled by the most. I mean, that's three OSHA violations. How many does it take uh, for that to set home for a contractor? And by, I would say by a you know, council accepting that kind of behavior, I mean, it's, they've had the violations. They've had their time to learn and, and for whatever reason have chose not to put their employees through the proper training or put the money and the time it takes to do it safely. I don't know, I can't answer that question, but, but the violations are off the federal website. It tells itself, I would say. And you represent? I work with uh, construction employees in the uh, community, operating engineers, Local 150. So is any of these other companies that were listed on here for bids, have they ever had any OSHA violations? You can look it up. We looked up Shipley and uh, Miller would be the next okay. two. Uh, neither one of those have okay. any OSHA violations on and, listed. And, through and no accidents or no accidents. mishaps? Or I mean, if you if you have an accident where it creates an injury, you have to notify, or the law says you're supposed to supposed notify to. OSHA. Yeah. So. Okay, thanks. I have this article from the Burlington Hawkeye dated March 1st. John C. Fye, owner of Fye Excavating in Sperry, was among 12 national finalists for the 2012 Contract of the Year Award sponsored by the construction equipment manufacturer Caterpillar and leading construction trade magazine Equipment World. And it goes on from there. So um, he's being recognized as someone who's responsible, obviously. Any other comments? Ready to vote. Okay, Kathleen. Anderson? Aye. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Thank you, folks. Motion's carried. <clears throat> One more resolution. I have a resolution approving the liquor license for the Capitol Theater Foundation doing business as Capitol Theater. Second that. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Uh, what is this about? Um, this was pulled from the consent agenda um, given the uh, position of uh, Councilman Anderson if she chose to abstain or not abstain that's up to her but if we didn't pull it off she'd have to abstain from all the votes on the consent so that's why it was pulled off and I plan to abstain because I am on the board of the Capitol Theater Foundation <laughs> and you don't approve of liquor <laughs> I don't have to say anything that's right <laughs> Well, <laughs> and that's the reason it was pulled, Your Honor. Okay. Any comments from the audience? Council? I think it's a routine thing. Okay. <laughs> Kathleen? But I respect your. Anderson? Abstain. Davidson? Aye. Fleming? Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Reed? Aye. Motion carried. Now is the time for comments from the audience. Anyone wishing to make a comment? concerning an item we have not previously discussed is welcome to do so at this time. Fair Renteria, 907 High Street. I wanted to bring to the council's attention, um, you may be aware of this, I, I'm just not sure, I haven't heard any discussion of it, but um, today is closing comments regarding the um, Chicago to Omaha mm -hmm. train and, and transportation issue that's um, being put forward by the Iowa Department of Transportation. And um, th this plan affects uh, transportation uh, across the entire uh, Midwest. And there are five different routes that are being evaluated by um, the Iowa Department of Transportation, Illinois Department of Transportation, as well as the federal DOT. And you know, we talk a lot about being engaged. And I, um, I, I just wanted to find out um, what the council's um, opinion is on this and what action has been taken. And I want to encourage, and maybe you're uh, light years ahead of me on this already, um, but I just want to uh, emphasize these are, I, I talk all the time about the, uh, about getting federal funds. Tonight we approved uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants for things that are local issues, and, and, I'm, and I'm so set against those. The one area that I think that the federal government should be involved with is, 
is interstate transportation. I think it's a great role for them, and it's where we should be engaged in, in doing positive things. So I was wondering if I, if I, I guess first of all, create awareness if there wasn't any, because this is, is critically important, um, but then also to see what the plan is or what engagement has, has taken place and see where the city council is going with this. I could speak to this a little bit. Uh, we all did receive something on this over a month ago. And uh, so we're all aware of it. And, and I know personally, I posted on my Facebook, I, and I've talked to Steve Freever, Downtown Partners, and we have encouraged people. I've commented on it and, and encouraged all our council people to in comment on it. Um, so, you know, I think we've been out there telling people co to comment on this. Okay. That, part of the reason I bring this up is that I heard about it yesterday. And, and I, I go out and talk to people um, all the time. And so um, one of the things that I um, want to try to encourage is, is we take a look at, at how we get messages out to the average person in Burlington. Um, because I, I just don't know that the people in Burlington understand um, that these issues are out there. And, and that they, I don't know that they're engaged enough to, to put an opinion um, on the state website and so I think we need to do a better job of, of getting these types of critical messages out to the average person I, I would agree with that thank you thank, thank you Rick. any other comments from the audience nine shamrock drive uh, I got to thinking the other day I fell on my head and uh, <laughs> swimming pool you know, we're always trying to appropriate money for a swimming pool. When we got into the uh, waterworks business out there with Randy Weingart, what was that, a million point nine? Point eight. Where'd the sure. money go? We loan him $1.9 million. He's giving us back that money, plus we're paying interest. <clears throat> so somewhere we should have a windfall in my books. We were put that in the kitty to give to somebody not, else? None of us were here at that time, but I, if I understand this right, correct me if I'm wrong. The city went into a partnership with Huckleberry Entertainment right. to help build the, the uh, water park right. on, on the basis of the performance that there be a return investment. on the investment, which, um, not surprising to some or surprising to others, it didn't happen. There's so, much we made some. So, uh, three years ago, was it, or four? Is it about that right? Yeah, three or four. We asked to be moved from the partnership with the agreement that Huckleberry Entertainment would repay uh, a money amount equivalent to what we thought the performer, the council thought the performer rating was going to be. So, each year in, I think it's December, we get money from the water park to pay back what we should have been getting along, along well, the road. So we're, no longer, so we're no longer in partnership with No, them. we're no longer in partnership, right. but I thought we had to put up $1.9 million or something like that for him to build it. That was the original plan. Actually, it's 1.8. 1.8. 1.8, and they're paying 180000 over the next 10 years to pay that back. Plus, we're paying the interest on the money he pays back. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good deal. Did I borrow some? Well, actually, there should be excess money in there somewhere. Is what I'm saying. I wonder where it's at. The thing was, the council went into this agreement with their eyes wide open, and it was in a business arrangement. Yeah. Mr. Weinger did not have to refund the city's money. He could have said, "Now here's the agreement. Stick with it." He chose to do that uh, to let us off the hook, so to speak, if that's how you want to term it. And then the city agreed again, previous council. That the 1.8 million being paid back in those installments was adequate compensation. Well, I can see helping Randy. He does a lot for the community, but still, Randy's a businessman. Mm -hmm. He knows. And it always seems like when we go into the business, we come out second. They must have a lot smarter lawyers than we do. You know, yeah. what appears to me. But still doesn't answer where the money is. I think somebody should look at that. I, I'm not sure what money you're talking about, Stan. The money we put up for him to build that. Well, it was, it was used to build it. It was used to build it. Right. Right. And we severed that relationship. Right. He paid us back. 
Yeah. Where's that money? He's paying us back. He's paying us back, but still, we've got that money. But I think we bonded because, for no, that. No, no, did, so, did yeah. we bond for that? And that so money that's coming back to us, we're using to pay back the bonds that yeah. we... The money would be that bond, huh? Yes. Yeah. That money's just so not sitting there by itself. If you looked at the, the sheet, it would show where he gave us that payment and it was paid on that bond? Yes. Yes, be a, yeah. yeah man, Stephanie could show that. you that. Yeah. All right, I'm not going to argue. I just wondered because I thought, man... I was worried about a few bucks, and there should be a bunch of money laying there. No, no but it's not. No. Uh, went by the ballpark. I go by it quite a bit. Isn't that known as Burlington Community Field? I don't it's what I've always yeah, known it as. Burlington Community Field. It's now there's a big sign out there. Did you see that? To the bees. Burlington. No, bees. it doesn't. It says uh, uh, American Legion. Well, oh. So, okay, that land is owned by the 40 and 8. I can understand that. And so, um, what we have, we have an agreement, the City of Burlington, because that is the City of Burlington Stadium. And so when we were looking at, 